Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. We are going to get into this study because it's a long one. So we're just going to dive right into it. The greatest commandment. We're in the third part of this study. Love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. And this one got me because I started doing some studies on it and it kept bringing me back to the heart, the heart. And we already talked about loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart. So I'm sitting there going, Lord, and it's one of those things where you sit and pray and say, Lord, open the scripture to me. What does it mean to love the Lord thy God with all thy mind? Okay. We always talk about this where, you know, they miss heaven by 13 inches, where it's up here and it's not down here. Okay. We got the knowledge, but we don't have the faith. So we talked about the heart, and now it's time to talk about the head. Okay. We're going to be talking about the head. We're going to talk, be talking about the mindset that we're supposed to have. Turn to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 23. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 17. God showed me these two verses, uh, and we're going to read uh, 17 and 22 in Ezekiel uh, 23. He showed me these verses, and they're exactly what, what he's talking about here. Okay. It says, And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind, here's the important part, that we're going to be talking about. And her mind was alienated from them. Her mind was alienated from them. Jump down to uh, chapter uh, verse 22 in chapter 23. Therefore, O Alibab, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated. And I will bring them against thee on every side. Thy mind is alienated. Is your mind alienated from God? Well, what does alienated mean? Looking through the 18, Webster's 1828 dictionary, it means to estrange, to withdraw, as the affections, to make indifferent or adverse. Indifferent. Okay. Being against. Where love or friendship before subsided. Where you were once friends before, now you're alienated. You're the opposite of friends, you're enemies. Right? As to alienate the heart of affection, to alienate a man from the friends of his youth, estranged, withdrawn from, stranger to. So it's not just, estranged is not just being the enemy, the opposite, you were friends and now you're enemies, but you, you, you forget who the person is. You don't know the person. Have you ever heard the saying, hey, that's not the person, I've said it before to some of the brethren, that my mentor, that's not the man that led me to Christ. He's starting to fall away to the world. That's not the man that led me to Christ. He, I mean, it's strange to him. That's not the man. Or you've heard that saying, that's, you know, that's, that's not the man that I once knew. Because they've changed. Okay? They become estranged. You were once friends, you once knew this person, and now you don't know this person. Okay? You become estranged. First Chronicles, like I said, always pause the video and turn. We've got a long study to go through. Do you forget who God is and what He has done for you? You forget who He is, what He's done for you, and you forget the fact that it's His way that matters. Not our way. Not the world's way. His way that matters. You become estranged. There's a lot of brethren out there that are starting to become estranged and they're not loving God with all their mind. They've lost that mindset. God's always right. And when I'm apart from God, I'm always right. God's always right. The flesh is always wrong. The world's always wrong. Satan's always wrong. The three enemies. They lose that mindset of who God is. They start limiting God. They start putting God in a box. I can't really do a box, but a box. They start putting God in a box. They start limiting God. They start trying to change God and get God to conform to them. When it's supposed to be the other way around, you're to conform to God. Your life's supposed to change according to His Word, and you're to conform to God. Okay? They become estranged from God. They were once His friend. They once knew who God was. and you got, that's, The Bible talks about the falling away. There'll be, come up. There'll be a falling away first. Then that man's sin is revealed and we get caught up. That event that happens. 
But there's going to be a falling away first. People are being alienated from their one true God, the God, capital G God of the King James Bible. And they're starting to fall for the lowercase g God of this world. The lo lowercase, yeah, lowercase g God of this world. I want to make sure I said it right. Uh, Satan. They try to be gods themselves. Remember what Satan promised Eve? You can be his gods knowing good and evil. So they turn themselves into gods. They follow false gods. The world becomes a god. The things of the world, you know, idolatry, the things of the world become gods. All right. First Chronicles 16, 15. First Chronicles 16, 15. Be mindful always of his covenant. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. God's word. How do we know who God is? By the Holy Spirit through his word. Can we see, once we got the Word in, in our heart, because we talked about loving God with all our heart, can we look out at nature and start seeing nature saying, wow, God created all this. I'm getting ahead of myself, but He created all this. Yes. But it starts with hiding God's Word in your heart. 2 Peter 3.2, we read. Remember it said, be mindful. 2 Peter 3.2, always have that on your mindset. God's way. Who God is, God's way, and what God has done for you. Always having that mindset. That's loving God with all your heart, and we're going to really get into it. 2 Peter 3, 2. That ye may be mindful of the words, mindful, mindful, of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Be mindful of God's word. Is God's words always on your mind? Or is the flesh always on your mind? Addictions, worldly, uh, fleshliness, sin, wickedness, worldliness, false religions, being part of a social club, these Babel buildings, organized religion, you know, Babel buildings, all these false religions. What's on your mind? Is God's Word on your mind a lot? It's always going to come back to God's Word. Remember, true love for Jesus Christ is what? Keeping His Word. And I get attacked a lot by these fakes and these frauds out there. Why? Because they don't love Jesus Christ. They like to say it verbally. But when we say, like Paul said, prove your own selves. Okay, are you abiding by God's word? Are you living the life of Christ today? Pauline epistles talk about how to live a life of Christ today. How to live in Christ Jesus. So he's looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. They get all upset and they get hateful. And their hate's not towards me, even though they try to say it's towards me. It's towards God's Word, perfect written Word. It's towards the one true God. Why? Because they don't know Him. They're estranged. 1 Corinthians 8.3 But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Paul said, prove your own selves. It's known of him. Do you love God with all your mind? Do you spend a lot of your time thinking about God? Who God is? His way? Making sure that you're living His way? Talking to God about what He's done for you? That's what prayer comes in, hardcore. You're talking to God all the time about your life. Does my life please you, Lord? Does my life line up with this book? Am I doing right by my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I being a servant to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I being your servant first and foremost, Lord? You wake up in the morning and you start your day with the Word of God and prayer. You end the day with the Word of God and prayer. That's why I've always pushed this. Are you reading this book a lot? Are you getting through this book at least once a year, completely getting through this book once a year, minimum? You should be able to get through it at least twice. I get through it two or three times a year. Do you get through it at least once a year? Where's your mindset at? Do you get distracted? Sometimes, brethren, I, I have grace for you because God has grace for me and I want grace from you, brother, sister, Christ, for me. Sometimes we're getting distracted by the flesh. We get distracted by the world. Satan comes in and tries to attack us and distract us and get, and get us to put this down. They distract our minds where we start getting worried about the world and what's going on in the world and we start losing focus. One of the biggest things, just a little side thing, one of the biggest things that I'm seeing among the body of Christ is we're losing focus. We're not 
We're not living for the catching away of the body of Christ. We're not preparing for Jesus to come back in the clouds. Well, how do we prepare? We continue to live the life of Christ. We preach the gospel. We preach the word. We stay in the word. We stay in prayer. We continue to do what's right in our lives to be a light to this dark world, to be a living and verbal witness to this world. That's preparing for Jesus Christ to come in the clouds, for us to go home someday. But you've got brethren out there that have been distracted by what's going on in the world. And now they're living like they're preparing for the time of Jacob's trouble. They're not looking for Jesus Christ to come back with the life that they're living. They're not out there gospel tracting and preaching the gospel. They're not staying in the Word of God. Some of them are handing the Word of God deceitfully. Some of them are um, wrestling the, word, uh, the, words, the Scriptures to their own destruction because they're getting distracted and they're doing things the world's way and they're getting fearful. Kind of like the, we're, since we're in the Old Testament, kind of like uh, Joshua and Caleb and the twelve that went out as, as spies to spy out the land that God promised them, they came back. People started getting fearful. And when they started getting fearful, what happened? They forgot who God is. They think they have to make the decisions. We can't do this, so we're going this way. We're going to go back to Egypt. Or i got to save myself, and I've got to do this to save myself from this wicked world and everything. They don't trust God. The ministry gets pushed to the side. Your walk with the Lord gets pushed to the side, and you get distracted by what's going on out in the world. Oh, we might have World War II. We might have an economic collapse. We, you know, and so on and so forth. What's going on at the southern border and everything? You know, immigration, illegal immigrants come in and all this. And oh, oh, it's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. Do you trust God? I know brethren in ministry that have turned their back on God because they're so distracted by what's going on in the world. I know brethren who had really good ministries starting out and they turn their back on good Bible preaching ministries to start being a news ministry. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a news ministry. What's going on? They've turned their back on God. They don't trust God. They've forgotten who God is. They've forgotten God's way. And the sad part is, is they've forgotten what God did for them. God did something for them to set them apart from this wicked world. Not to start acting like it. Not to start uh, intermingling with it. Conforming to it. Loving it. Start getting fearful over it. Remember, we're not given a spirit of fear. We're going to get into a lot of that. But, brothers and Christ, what I see is a lot of the brethren are, it's more like your guys are preparing for the time of Jacob's trouble. You're not living for that blessed hope. When you have a man, that, any man in ministry that's turned their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ, they're no longer preparing for that blessed hope. They're looking for the man of sin. They're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble with the life that they're living. But it's just Christ. We need to get back to looking to that for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. Are you living the life of Christ? God will take care of what's going on in the world. Everything that seems to be going on in the world, oh, it's over. It's happened before. In the last 2,000 years, there was wars, there was economic collapses, there was famines, you know, all kinds of stuff over and over and over. God's got that handled. We're supposed to take care of this. We're supposed to live a life of Christ. We're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness for Jesus Christ. Our desire is to see as many people get saved and start living the life of Christ with us. Okay. Loving God with all your mind is always being mindful of who God is, His way, and what He's done for us. So we're going to just, there's so many scriptures we can go over, but we're trying to keep this small. Who God is. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, there's a lot of other verses that talk about that. Okay, Is come in the flesh. Not has come, is come in the flesh. Okay, Why? Because He's eternal. How often do we forget that God is eternal? He was there from the beginning, and he'll be there clear out if there is an end. There's different end, there's ends to dispensations in the Bible, and God was there at each time. There'll be an end to this world, because we're gonna this world's gonna get destroyed, and God's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth. And he'll be there. 
God's been there from the very beginning. He's eternal. That means he knows what he's doing. But people forget that. They think God's just, oh, he just, he just got that Godship right now. And he's just, you know, he's new. He, he's a newbie. And he doesn't really quite know what he's doing and everything. And you've got people that treat him like that. Is that you, brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to what's going on in the world? God's eternal. Revelation 22, 13, we read, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. God's eternal. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the capital W Word, Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. And the Word was with God, body and soul. And the Word was God. The body and soul are connected. They are one. Jesus is God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. The same was in the beginning with God. In the beginning. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There is a scripture here where it talks about God is not man that He should repent. You know what that means? He's perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. The Bible talks about how God does not lie. People have forgotten this. They start doubting God's word. What you're doing is you're treating God as a liar. Oh, Paul said plenty of times that he's looking for that blessed hope. Plenty of times. But because Paul was told he was going to die tomorrow, therefore he wasn't looking for that blessed hope in his lifetime. You have people who doubt the word of God. What are they doing? They're calling God a liar. We've shown plenty, of, not in this study, but we've shown in other studies, we've shown plenty of scriptures where we come across them. Paul is, is hinting that he's looking for the blessed hope. He even commands us, present tense, looking for for that blessed hope. He's saying that to the brethren at his, in his time. All the way up to this time. We're supposed to be looking, present tense, for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. Our eyes are supposed to be on Jesus Christ, not the world. Not Satan, the man of sin. Not the mark of the beast. Not the time of Jacob's trouble. Our eyes are supposed to be on Jesus Christ. He created all things. Mm -hmm. Nothing made by that was not made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness compre comprehended it not. God has given us salvation. We're going to get to that about what he's done for us. All throughout the Bible, God's been saving man by his grace. God's about saving. He's about having grace, forgiveness, mercy. But when you reject God's grace, forgiveness, mercy, so that you can have this flesh, the wicked body of flesh, do things the flesh's way, so you can have the world, point out the window there, the world, and you end up doing things Satan's way, the lowercase g God of this world, then God's grace and mercy isn't on you. His love's not on you. People forget who God is. Some people treat God as if, I'm getting ahead of myself. Some people treat God as if he's just a monster, just hateful and vengeful. Some people treat God like he's one big lo loving teddy bear. That's just, you just hug and hug and hug and all he is is love. No, he isn't. He has love, but he's not only love. God is slow to anger. He, he's wrath, he has wrath, he's vengeful. He's righteous. And so much, and so many other things. He's he's the he's wise. He's the smartest person. Uh, Jesus is the smartest person you'll ever meet. He can look at the heart. But let's go. Okay, who God is? He's perfect. He was there from the beginning. He created everything. He created you and me. Creator of all things. Have you forgotten that, brother? Says Christ. That he's been around for 6, 000, more than 6,000 years. When you actually do the math, the earth is only like six to 7,000 years old. Don't believe the lie of uh, even people trying to claim to be Christians that try to come in and try to bring evolution in with the Bible. They don't mix. The earth is not millions of years old. It's only six to 7,000 years old. Okay? 
God's been around since the beginning. You don't think he doesn't know man? We're going to get into this. God is perfect. God created everything. God has been there from the very beginning. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't lie. His way. Like I said, there's a lot more we can say about who God is. But we're trying to get through all this really quick. His way. Have you forgotten God's way? And, and we're not talking about everything that's God's way. Like something as simple as abstain from all appearance of evil. Why? Because that's God's way. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Why? Because it's God's way. It goes back to the, the Levitical laws when it says, uh, Thou shalt not murder. Why? Because God said so. He says it's wrong. That's God's way to say it's wrong. God's way is you don't murder. God's way is you don't bear false witness. God's way is you don't put evil wickedness before your eyes. Okay? God's way is you love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Correct them. Try to get them back on the right path. That's what love is. To see them on their heart right with the Lord. But you love your brothers. Why? Because that's God's way. One of the biggest things as we're getting into His way that I always talk to people is like, the way the world is so messed up is, yes, we've got the laws of God that are written on every man's heart. We have the Holy Spirit. And we've got God's perfect written word. Before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Nobody is without excuse when it comes to knowing God's way. And the world today tries to take God out of the equation and make it a morality thing, a man's morality. And look how wicked this country has become. I'm in America. Look how wicked this country has become when they took God out of the equation. It's no longer God says it's wrong. Our laws are based off the Bible. Or when we say this is wrong, it's because God says it's wrong. When they took God out of the equation and it became man's morals, it was so quick and easy to do away with good laws. And we've done away with a lot of good laws in this country. And we replaced them with bad ones that are okay with sin and justify sin and wickedness. Why? Because it, we got away from that idea of God's way is what matters. It's man's way that matters. It's man's morality that matters. It's what we think. Feelings and opinions are what matter. Not the authority of God. It's perfect through His perfect written word. Like I said, the laws of God that are written on every man's heart, the Holy Spirit goes out the world and reproves the world of sin, the lost world reproves them of sin according to the laws of God that are written on their hearts. Get some say, tries to get people saved. Well, we preach the gospel, but then they have God's word. God's word gets put in their hand. Those three witnesses, people without excuse. Isaiah fifty-five six. Isaiah fifty-five six. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm talking about God's. My thoughts are not God's thoughts. Neither are my ways... I'm sorry, I'm doing it backwards. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Mine's talking about God. Yours is talking about the people. Mankind. For my thoughts, God's thoughts, are not our thoughts, your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. We're supposed to conform to God. He's not going to conform to us. He's not supposed to, and He's not going to. We're to conform to God. Is your mindset, because you might not know everything that's God's way. God's still showing me some things that I'm doing wrong and showing me you know, some things that we need to do more of and work harder on. Okay? He's still showing me things, but as a babe in Christ, he showed, there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. But my mindset was, Lord, I want to do things your way. What are your thoughts, Lord? What do you say? What is your way? I want to please you. I was created to please you. I want to please you. It's that mindset. Are you loving God with all your mind? You got. You want to do things God's way. Lord, what is your way? For, you might not know everything. God was slowly revealing it to you and, and cleaning up your life and showing you that things might change. You might be doing something that God wants you to do 
And as the world gets more wicked and the people harden their hearts, God says, nope, I want you to stop this over here and I want you to go over here now. And you're like, well, why am I stopping this here? God knows. God can see what we can't see. God's ways are not always. There's a lot of times in the Bible where people are like, well, why would you want me to do that, Lord? That makes no sense. Go to Nineveh? You remember Jonah? Uh, Jonah? Go to Nineveh? Why would you want me to go to Nineveh? I'm going to Tarsus. Because they don't know what God has planned. Remember what it says here. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heathens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I'm sorry, for as the heavens, I said heathens, forgive me Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth. That makes more sense. I stopped myself, that doesn't make sense Lord. Sometimes we misread, forgive me, it's my fault. For as the heavens are higher than the earth. Remember there's three heavens. So it's not just the heavens higher, but then there's the second heaven and the third heavens. And the three heavens make up the heaven that was created at the very beginning, but God stretched them out. The heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Have you forgotten that, brother, sister Christ? Have you forgotten who God is? Have you forgotten that God knows what he's doing? That's where the trust can in. We did videos on that about trusting God with all your heart. But that's where trust really comes in. And having that mindset, God knows what he's doing. I might not get it right now. Maybe he'll show it to me in my lifetime while we're still here. Or maybe I have to wait until we get caught up and we have the full mind of Christ. Then we'll see clearly. Because right now the Bible talks about we look through a glass darkly. But when we see him face to face, everything will become clear. We'll understand why things happen the way they happen down here. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. We're getting to God's Word now again. Remember he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. How do we know God's thoughts? Through the Word of God. Not through feelings and opinions. Not guessing. Not listening to the lowercase g God of this world. Not listening to the flesh. Not listening to world. God's Word. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and in the joints and of marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This book's got our number. I always say this, this book, everything that's going on in the world today is no shock. This book's got the world's number. God's talked about what's going on in the world. Okay? Time and time again, you go back and you read the Gospels, how Jesus could see their hearts. They murmured within their hearts. They weren't saying it out loud. They were talking in their hearts. People always ask, well, how can somebody who's a, a, a mute pray a prayer? Uh, you talk in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you can talk within your heart. And we learned this about, I think her name was Hannah, if I've got the right one. Where she, uh, Samson's, no, Daniel, I gotta get the right names, uh, Daniel's mother, Samuel, sorry, Samuel, I gotta get it right, forgive me, brothers of Christ, a lot of names trying to go through the Bible lately, Samuel, 1 Samuel, her mother, if it was Rachel, if it's wrong, I'm wrong, but his mother was praying, and only her lips were moving, nothing was coming out, no voice, no nothing, she wasn't praying out loud, she was praying in her heart. You can still pray out of your heart. okay? But God, Jesus, he heard what they said in their hearts. Because he's God the Father manifests in the flesh. The body, the Son of God, can see the heart. God the Father can see the heart. And God's perfect written word by the Holy Spirit sees the heart. Okay? The thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the number one reason people don't like this book. The world as a whole, they don't like the King James Bible. And mainly, it's the King James Bible, it comes down to, they don't like final authority. They don't like that this is the final authority. That this is perfect. Why? Because it calls out their heart left and right. It calls out who they are, their wickedness, their sin. It calls out false converts. 
wolves in sheep's clothing, snakes, serpents. It calls out the lost world for what they are and where they're going. Without Jesus Christ, where are you going to go? Hell. And then the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. They don't like this being perfect. They don't like this being the final authority. They don't like this being the standard. Paul said, prove your own selves. We use this. Do you line up with this book? You claim to love Jesus. You claim to be a Christian. Do you line up with this book? No, you line up with the flesh. You line up with the world. You line up with false religions that worship Satan. You line up with Satan, the three enemies. You line up with the three enemies. You're not a Christian. You're not saved. This book knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. 2 Corinthians 4.2 2 Corinthians 4.2 Okay. So we know that his thoughts are our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. We're naturally going to try to do things that are contrary to God. That's what when we're born. We're born into a world of sin and we're going to start out by trying to go against God. And it take, today it takes salvation to get back on the right path, to get back on the right track, to serving God and doing things his way. 2 Corinthians 4.2 but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. I just talked about it. What's the number one person that taught hands the word of God deceit, deceitfully? People who don't want to conform to this book. They don't want to conform to God. They want God to conform to them. They don't want God to be the final authority. They want to be the final authority. They want something of the flesh. They want something of the world. Satan comes in and tries to snatch the seeds that are being sown for instruction and righteousness, the seeds that are being sown. He doesn't want you following this book and this book having the mindset that this book is the final authority. God is still to this day teaching me things, showing me how to clean up a little bit more of my life, how to live better, how to be stronger in my faith, how to be stronger in my walk with the Lord. God's always teaching me because this is the final authority and my mindset is this. God, who God is, what He's done, and His way, we're on His way right now. His way, the only way I'm going to find out His way is through the perfect written Word of God by the Holy Spirit that He's given me. But some people are handing the Word of God deceitfully. They don't want that. Their mindset is, is I don't want this to be perfect. Because then I have to give up sin. I have to change my life. I've got to conform to God. I'd rather conform to the world. What does the Bible say? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This comes in. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The truth is what matters. But why do people change it? We said that. You want to know why other people change it? Turn to, if you can, turn to 2 Peter. Turn to 2 Peter. I've already said that. Love not the world. They start loving things of the world. And what do they do? They try to change the word of God so they can have things of the world. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. They start becoming estranged from God. 2 Peter 3.16 As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Hard to be understood. Or maybe you don't want to understand it. Because, once again, it means I have to give up things. It means I've got to conform to God. But there's some things in the Bible, what this is talking about mainly, in 2 Peter, there's some things in the Bible that people don't get. Like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They try to limit God. Well, how can God be in heaven and open the seal and come in the clouds and call us home? Because I said those events are simultaneous. One will happen, they happen back to back. 
You can't have one without the other. I might have slipped up and said at the same time, but hey, if it happens at the same time, it happens at the same time. If it happens back to back, it happens back to back. But they're like, how can God, how can God the Father be in heaven calling down saying, well done, thou good and faithful one, and be in Jesus Christ at the same time? Great is the mystery of godliness. What do people do? They start making, putting God in a box. They start putting God in a box. They don't understand it. I don't understand. Why does this? What about? I just, what does the Bible say you do when you don't understand something? Do you wrestle the scriptures to your own destruction, or do you stay, take a step back, like I've done plenty of times, and I know other brethren have too, and you pray to God for understanding, for wisdom? Ask, you ask of God who give it to all men liberally and abraith not. You come to God and say, Lord, I don't get it. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to try to figure it out with my own wisdom. I don't want to be torn this way or that way with the worldly wisdom. Lord, I want the truth and, and only you can show me the truth. Lord, please open the scriptures to me. Help me to understand this. But you get people that they get puffed up. They think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. They get prideful. My opinion is, my feelings are, I've seen people here on YouTube, their, their channel becomes more of a talk show, and it's more of coming to me for me to tell you what I think and my opinions are, instead of, let's find out what God says. And I feel sorry for some of those brethren who have fallen into that trap. And they tend to rest the scriptures to their own destruction or they're handling the word of God deceitfully when it becomes about them being the final authority. The pride, think more highly of themselves. I got to know what this means so I'll just make something up because everyone looks to me and I got to know what this means. There's times I've had brethren ask me questions that on the spot at that time I was clueless and I told them, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to look into it. And I looked into it, I prayed over it, and God showed me answers. But if I don't know, I'm going to say, I don't know. Babes in Christ, I said that a lot when I was a babe in Christ. If you're newly saved and you're just getting into the book, you're going to have the enemy hit you up with a lot of questions that you might not be able to answer. And a lot of the questions are deceptive and everything. The best thing you, you can say is stay in the Word of God but say, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. I'm going to have to study it. Don't try to have the answers right on the spot. I know we're supposed to be ready to give an answer to them that the hope is in you. That's your testimony. That's the gospel. But when it comes to the rest of this book, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. It's going to take time. It's going to take study. It's going to take some life experiences where you're taking the Word of God and applying it to your life, and you're going through experiences. So if you don't know something, you say, I don't know it. But you get men that are so puffed up and prideful, i got to know everything. They look to me, I am the final authority. No, you're not. This is the final authority. This is not the final authority. My whole, I like to preach the Word of God. How do we know who God is and His way? Through the Scriptures. We're reading Scriptures. But my push, brother, sister, Christ, has always been, this is the final authority. Are you staying in this? Are you reading this every day? Are you praying over this? Are you applying it to you? When, it, when it comes to hiding it in your heart, means you're living it. Are you applying it to your life and living it? If God says, don't do this, are you not doing it? Are you getting stuff out of your life that's bad? And getting things in your life that God says is good? This is the final authority. I might not always be around. Okay? This is the final authority. And we can get into the trap of, you know, the Bible talks about respecter of persons. And when that person gets old and passes away, everything seems to fall apart in these battle buildings. When you have a good man of God that is raised up and he preaches for 50 years, he dies, the whole system, that, that, that system either it falls apart because it'll change. It'll either fall apart completely. And the people will scatter and go find other clubs to be part of. Or it'll change to the point where it's not the same ministry as it was before. Because everyone was so dependent on that man. Oh, we need that man, we need that man. Am I of Paul or Apollos? 
Was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in my name? Talk about spiritual baptism, not water baptism. Spiritual baptism. Who does the baptizing? Jesus Christ does. I don't. I don't save nobody. Jesus saved you. Jesus gave you his Holy Spirit. Jesus gave you his perfect written word. Okay? That's the foundation. I'm here to help you. I'm here to guide you through the Bible. But it's up to you to stay on top of this book. I'm not the final authority. But you've got people out there that have been teaching for so long, they seem to have, like they have to have an answer for everything. I'll give you another example. Um, there was a brother in Christ that would always say, I, I don't always have the answer. I just want you guys to know I don't always have the answer. But the answer to that is this. He always had to act like he had the answer. Just because they say one thing, remember, words and deed, words and deed, do they line up? His deeds are, I have the answers to everything. But with his words, oh, I don't have the answer to everything. But the answer to that question is this. Then someone else, well, I don't have the answers to everything. But the answer to that, it's good to have answers, absolutely. But why make that statement? If you know the answer, just give the answer. Why do you have to say, I don't know? Because he acts like he knows everything. You can't sit there and say, well, I just don't know. I'll have to look into that. God really hasn't revealed that to me yet. What happens when you get people that get so puffed up, they start resting the scriptures to their own destruction. Coming out with false teachings, false doctrine, because they don't get what the Bible's saying. 1 John 2.14, 1 John 2.14 I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. Will we just read who was in the beginning? Him that was in the beginning? The Godhead. Jesus Christ. The body. God the Father. The soul. It talks about the spirit hovering over the water. The spirit was there. The Godhead was there. That's the him. I have known him from the beginning. You, do you know God fully and completely through Jesus Christ from the very beginning? A lot of people don't. Jesus is not God the Father then you don't worship the Jesus of the King James Bible. You worship the pagan Antichrist that's to come. you got that Antichrist spirit. There's only one capital G God, the Father, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Only one. If thou believest there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. There's only one capital G God, it's the Father. And if Jesus is not connected to God where they are one, if he's not God the Father manifest in the flesh... Jesus isn't God. Their Jesus isn't God. Capital G God. He's a lowercase g God. Okay. From the very beginning, we're reading here. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. How do we overcome the wicked one? How do you overcome the flesh? How do you overcome the world? How do you overcome the wicked one? The three enemies. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The Bible talks about you have the Holy Spirit in you, not the spirit of the world. And it's this book. You wonder why the enemy's trying so hard to get rid of this book. They're trying to change your mindset of trusting God. Knowing His way. They don't want you knowing God's way. They don't want you knowing who God is. The, the, the true God. The capital G God. Okay. They want you to know the worldly version of God. Where they get God to conform to them. So they can have what they want. Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 1 Corinthians 8.3, we're going to keep reading this verse over and over. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. One of the biggest things we always push in with false converts is what's their attitude towards this book? What's their attitude to who God really is? What's their attitude towards God's way? Okay. What's their real attitude and actions when it comes to what God has done for them? Now we're going to get into that. What has God done for you? We didn't do, go into specifics on what God's way is. We just know that God has His way, and we try to do things our way, and we need to give up our way for His way. We need to conform to Him. 
What has God done for us? We're going to get into this one a lot. Revelation 4.11. Revelation 4.11. First, He's created us. He's given us our existence. He's given us life. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. He created us. He's given us life. He's the life, light of, life is, that, is in that light. He's the light of the world. He gives life. Some people forget He can take it. They don't fear God. It goes back to fearing God. People don't fear God. Why? Because they're estranged from God. They don't know who He is. God can take my life like that. God can take your life like that. He can take the life of anybody. But one of the biggest pushes when we do salvation, behold, now is the time of salvation. Behold, now is the day. Behold, now is the accepted time. It's to, you need to get saved now. Why? Because you could die tomorrow. God could take your life tomorrow. And then tomorrow will be too late. That's why we push people to get saved today. Struggle with the flesh. Struggle with the world. Struggle, you know, to put on the whole armor of God. To be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Fighting the devil tomorrow, but get saved today. There might not be a tomorrow. God created all things. He created us, and why were we created? To please God. Colossians 1.16 we read, For by Him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. You know, temporal, the visible, eternal, stuff we can't see yet. Some people, like Paul, was blessed with getting to see a little glimpse of heaven. Eternal. Okay. Visible and invisible. Whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities. Thrones and dominions. You mean God's the one that's setting everything up in the world today? These people reject Him. They hate Him. They love the flesh. They love the world. They're worshiping Satan. They want things their way. So what does God do? Okay, I'll let you have your way. And look what happens. God's setting everything up for us to go home in the time of Jacob's trouble to start. He's in charge. How many of you have forgotten Nebuchadnezzar? He says, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Nebuchadnezzar was a lost, heathen man. He's a type of antichrist. He, th he, he thought himself to be his own god. But he had to admit that God, capital G God, was higher than the lowercase g gods. But he never admitted that there was only one true God. Be careful when men come forward and say, Oh, you know, he was a saved man. I believe he was a saved man. You're dealing with someone who's mentally ill. Completely mentally ill. He's a lost man that still had to obey God. He couldn't do something that God didn't want him to do. I'm not talking about sin and wickedness. I'm talking about when it comes to affecting God's people. God is still in charge. This world cannot do nothing to us, brothers and Christ, without His permission. Have you guys forgotten that? I know some bro a brother in Christ that used to preach that, and now he's getting so fearful of the world. They, if they come in here, I'm going to shoot them, or this, or that. They've gotten so fearful of what the world can do to them, they've forgotten who God is. He used to preach, well, I, I don't, I'm not fearful because they can't do nothing to me without God's permission. We pray for God's protection. We pray that God keeps them busy fighting amongst themselves and keeps them off our backs so we can continue living the life of Christ and preaching the gospel. But if I have to die, I have to die for Jesus Christ. Now it's the, the, they've done a 180 and they're so worried, they're trying to fortify and protect themselves, and they're so worried about the world that their walk with the Lord takes a back seat, the, the ministry takes a back seat, Preaching the gospel, being a living and verbal witness takes a back seat. It's all about we have to fight this wicked world on our own. You're going to fail every time because you're going to be fighting against God. God's the ones allowing everything to happen, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't be fearful. Our God is in control. Why are you afraid? Our God is in control. Whether they be thrones or dominions. Or principalities. Or power. Nobody comes to power without God knowing it. Oh, this person came, came to power. And God, God really didn't want that. But God had no choice. No, he allowed it to happen. God's got a plan. Do you trust God? 
The lost world tries to use that, and they do. They use that to draw a lot of people away from the gospel and from the truth. Why would a loving God do this? And why? They start questioning God. Well, why would he do this? And why would he do that? And half the time, the thing that claiming God did, it wasn't God, it was them. God being a wicked person. No, he's not. You're the wicked one. And he's had grace and mercy to allow you to live to this point so you can still get saved. Because he could kill you in a second and send you home. Remember in the old scriptures where it talks about where he's wet his sword at the whetstone? Sharpen his sword, he had bent his bow. If you don't repent, what's going to happen? He's going to kill you and send you to hell. The fact that you're still standing and breathing and able to talk shows that he has mercy. The great mercy of God. You can still get saved. You can still get burnt, born again. But all these people, they'll, talk, they'll start questioning God. Well, why is God doing this? Why is God... God shows us a lot of why he's doing things through his word. But when you don't get something, you trust God. God is perfect. God knows what he's doing. When you start questioning God, you start trying to bring God down to your level. You start trying to put God in a box. You're trying to get God's way, his thoughts, to conform to your thoughts. You're trying to get his ways to conform to your ways. What did the Bible just say? They're not our ways. His thoughts aren't our thoughts. His ways aren't our ways. Our powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. By him. But there's the life part. He can take your people's lives. He gives life. He can take it. He created us, and we were created to please God. And what pleases God? Ecclesiastes 12.13. Ecclesiastes 12.13. The infamous Ecclesiastes 12.13. It was cold this morning, and now it's starting to warm up. Ecclesiastes 12.13 Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. People who question God. Are, I, I'm, I'm letting you know right now, Brother Christ, there's times where I said, Lord, why are you doing this? Or why did you allow this to happen? And I stopped myself. Well, I, I'm not questioning you. It's right. You allowed it to happen. You know what you're doing. I trust you, Lord. But what's your plan? See, I'm starting to try to get to that angle. Lord, is there a way, is there something in here that you could show me that You've got a plan. Well, everything's falling apart. The, his plan is he's bringing together the one, to, for the one world order, one world religion, one world economy, one world currency, one world Bible. And he's bringing it all together so he can call us home and start the time of Jacob's trouble. He's working things out. But there's a lot of things that it's like, well, Lord. And I catch myself questioning him. And I've got to stop that. I've got to ask God for understanding. Pray to God for wisdom. Lord, help me to understand what's going on. Not questioning you what you're doing or allowing to happen, but coming to you asking for wisdom to understand what's going on. Okay. Fear God. Fear God. Stop questioning Him. Do we fear God? And keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. We've always said this. This is just, just the way it is. If you're not keeping his commandments, it's because you don't fear God. And if you fear God, the evidence of fearing God is that you keep his commandments. It's just that simple. But there's this Christ, I, as a saved sinner, there's times where I stop keeping his commandments and it hit me. It's like, do I fear God? In my actions and my deeds, I'm not fearing God. I've strayed. I've given in, to, like as a newly saved, all the way to now. There's times where I still make mistakes. There's times where I slip and fall flat on my face. And God's, it's a wake-up call. Do I fear God? Then why am I keeping His commandments? Why am I doing things I know I'm not supposed to do? I need to get back to fearing God, and fearing God is keeping His commandments. Why? Because I'm going to have to answer to God someday. We all answer to God. One of the biggest lies I was told as a false convert is once you get saved, you're free and clear. That's a lie. That's a total lie. The Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone, saved and lost, is going to have to give an account of himself to God. We do it at the judgment seat of Christ. They do it at the great white throne where they're going to be judged. 
everyone still has to answer to God. The false convert, the false religions, the easy believism, they take the fear of God away. You don't actually have to fear God. You can still live however you want. You can, you can go to heaven and have the world too. Uh, no. We are created to fear God and keep His commandments. And they go hand in hand. If you fear God, you keep His commandments. What's the number one commandment for today? Obey the gospel. Why? Because this is the whole duty of man. We get saved by God's grace. doesn't matter what dispensation. You get saved by God's grace and you start living for God. You start taking His word, His commands into your heart and living them to please God. It's the way it's always been. But people lose sight of that mindset that God knows what He's doing, who God is, He knows what He's doing, His way, and what He's done for us. He created us. He gave us life. And today that life is in His Son. We're going to get to that. But Exodus 14, 13, Exodus 14, 13, I wanted to read, uh, just, we're just going to go through it real quick. The Old Testament where they talk about salvation of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord. Exodus 14, 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more. He parts the Red Sea, and they walk across it. God saves them. There's present tense salvation, and there's eternal salvation. But regardless which one we're talking about, God does the saving. Have you forgotten that? God's the one that does it. I can't save nobody eternally. And God can use me to help a brother in Christ out, but it's God through me. I give God the glory. Remember, we give God all the thanks. We give God all the glory. We give God all the credit. But you have some people that love to take the credit for themselves. If I help a brother in Christ out, it wasn't me that saved him. God used me. God gave me the, 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 the strength, the, the ability to put me in a position where I could help him. God saved that man, not me. But you have temporary like salvation in the moment down here. Because the Bible talks about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's talking about in this life. It's not talking about eternal salvation. There's eternal salvation and there's temporary salvation. What we just read there, they were saving them from the Egyptians. They crossed the Red Sea. Exodus 15.2 The Lord is my strength and song and He has become my salvation. He is my God. Well, He can't be your God if you're estranged. You're not, you're not acting like He's your God if you don't know who He is. If you don't know Him. You don't know His ways and what He's done for you. He has become my salvation. He is my God. He saved me. He created me. He, he gave me purpose. What is that? Fear God and keep His commandments. To please Him. And I will prepare Him and habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. When was the last time you exalted God in your life? I'm not saying be like those fakes and frauds that go out of the way to put on a show, but at home when no one's around, when's the last time you gave God the glory? Oh, thank you, Lord, for this. Even if it's out loud or if it's in your heart. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for that. Oh, praise God for that. Oh, wow, Lord, that is amazing. The sunset, the way the clouds are forming, going for a walk, seeing all these neat trees. Talking with the Lord. Wow, Lord, you created all this. You're amazing, Lord. Exalting God. Deuteronomy 32, 15, we read, But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. What happened? He became estranged. The God which made him. Brother says Christ, that's what we're seeing today. People are forgetting God Almighty is the one that created you. And you're not esteeming the rock of your salvation. The only way to, to salvation, Jesus Christ. The only way to heaven, Jesus Christ. And you've got to do it His way. 
Not the world's way, easy believism. Not the world's way where you have to earn salvation. The world's way is either you've earned it or you're earning it. I've earned salvation with my faith, so I don't have to repent. There is no repentance. There is no prayer. There is no changed life. I've earned salvation with my faith. That's what this easy believism is. Now I can do whatever I want because I earned it. That's their attitude. They don't say that openly, but that's the life that they live. Look at them. They look like the world, act like the world. Their flesh is in charge. They're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. But they've got a profession of faith. They don't know who God is. They're clueless. The God that, which made them. The God that has provided salvation, a way for them to go to heaven. They're clueless. They're estranged. They don't love God with their mind. We already talked about the heart and the soul. They don't love God with the heart or the soul. They don't love God with the mind. 2 Samuel 2, 3, 22, 3. 2 Samuel 22, 3. The God of my rock... Remember what's that talk, when they say rock, what they're talking about? The rock of their salvation. In Him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. Do you trust God? God saved you. He didn't save you so you can continue looking like the lost world and acting like the lost world. Continue in the direction that was leading you to hell. He saved you so He could set you apart from this world. So now you can be a light for Him. So Jesus can shine through you to this dark world. Jesus hasn't shined through you if you look like the lost world, act like the lost world, dress like the lost world, talk like the lost world. That light dims to where there is no light, and you just all you're showing the lost world is, is God's happy with how you're living and who you are, present tense. He's okay with your sin. Well, if God was okay with their sin, they wouldn't be on their way to hell. God's not okay with their sin. He's not okay with their wickedness, their worldliness. He's not okay with them going against Him with the life that they're living. You're supposed to be a set apart and be different to say, this is how God wants us to live. This is how we're supposed to be because I belong to Him and I serve Him. And when they don't meet the standards, because remember one time we didn't meet the standards, when they realize they're not meeting the standards, it's supposed to convict them that they're dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, good, no good sinners like we once were. Getting ahead of myself. But Paul, I've talked to a brother in Christ about that. Uh, Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. But he's talking about at salvation. After salvation, he's not the chiefest of sinners. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid how we are dead to sin live any longer therein. There was a change in Paul's life. He's not the same man. He's not that chiefest of sinners anymore. He was at salvation, but not now. But people try to take things like that because they love sin. They love their wickedness. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Salah. That's Psalms 3.8. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Who does the saving? God does. There's a lot of people that are like sheep. And yes, God put shepherds out here for them. But they think that shepherd that God puts out here, not Jesus Christ, he's the ultimate shepherd. But I'm talking about men in ministry, and they think those men in ministry can save them. I can't save you, brothers and sisters Christ, when it comes to eternal salvation. I can't save you. God might bless me with being able to save you in the moment, being able to help brethren out in the moment. But when it comes to eternal salvation, I can't save you. I'm not the foundation. It goes back to Paul. Was, were you crucified in my name? Were you baptized in my name? Talking about Holy Ghost baptized? You weren't saved. I can't save you. Only God can. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Psalms 13, 5. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Goes back to loving God with all your heart. Loving God with all your soul. You get saved. That's evidence that you love God with all your soul. You love the salvation that God gave you with all your heart, that's loving God with all your heart, and you remember what God did for you. Loving God with all your mind. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I will trust. 
the buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalms 18.2. My high tower? You mean God will protect us? We, we might still have to die for God's word. He talks about being martyrs. Uh, they say martyrs, but, you know, having to die for God's word. Having to die for standing for, our, for the gospel and for the real Jesus Christ. But when it comes to the rest of this world, when they're fighting over money and power and land and, and sin and wickedness, this world's fighting amongst each other, God's our high tower. God can still protect us from, that, from the world. He's protected me from the world. I know there's some brethren who live in city and they have to go out there and they have to deal with the lost world on a day-to-day -day basis. But for the most part, God can protect you from that. If you're taking, you know, slack for believing in God, the real Jesus Christ, being a King James Bible believer, that's called trials and tribulation. That's being persecuted for Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. But when they're fighting over a car or, or land or something like that, they're out there doing that and God's protecting us because we are set apart from the world. <clears throat> we don't go out there and start being part of that. These battle buildings, you don't invite lost and saved in. You don't invite that stuff into your fellowship, into your walk with the Lord. We stay away from that stuff and let them fight themselves. Let them destroy themselves. We try to preach the gospel to them. We try to plant seeds. But in the end, they reject Jesus Christ. Let them they're going to just end up destroying themselves. He's our high tower. Have you forgotten that? Stay away from sin. Stay away from wickedness. Set yourself apart from this world. And yes, in these last days, it seems like a lonely life. But get into the Bible. Get into prayer. Get into walking and talk. Get your walk with the Lord strong. And you won't feel so lonely. There's times I still feel lonely. But the Lord has to remind me, I'm still here. I'm with you. Remember what Paul said? All men forsook me. But Jesus was with me. Psalms 1846, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Have you forgotten what Jesus has done for you? You can always tell a lot of the fakes and frauds that just say a simple prayer, and they go back to living the way they, they lived before. You know what that means? They've forgotten what, they've forgotten the whole point of salvation. They forgot the whole point of God saving them. To set them back on the right path so they could go to heaven and set them back on the right path. That you belong to Him. You're about pleasing Him, about fearing God and keeping His commandments. You're about living for Jesus Christ, being in Christ Jesus our Lord. But they're like, oh, I said my little prayer at this Babel building, this little clubhouse that I'm a part of, and then you go back to living like the world. 1 Corinthians 8.3 But if any man love God, the same is known of him. What we just read in Psalms 18.46 And let the God of my salvation be exalted. Not just in words, but in deed. Does the life that you live exalt the God of your salvation? I always say that. When someone says, they, oh, I'm saved, I'm saved. Does your life prove it? If you're put on trial for being a Christian today... This is the foundation. Jesus is the judge. They always make Jesus out to be the lawyer. No, Jesus is the judge. Jesus is sitting on the, up in the judge's bench. And he's judging you according to this book. Is there enough evidence to convict you? If you're being put on trial for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Well, I go to the Bible buildings. It's not in the Bible. Going to church is not in the Bible. Well, I put on my Sunday best. That's not in the Bible for today. It's not in there. Well, I give my 10% tithe. That's not in here for today either. Sorry. That, none of that proves you're a Christian. What about the changed life? What about your heart? We're talking about that. Your mind, your soul, your heart, and we're going to go to your body. Your strength is, the is, is going to be the next teaching. Are you showing you love God with these, with the life that you're living? That's what you're going to be judged on. That's what we're supposed to judge. Are you living a life of Christ? Are you loving God with all your mind? Is your mindset on pleasing God? Who He is, what He's done, His way, what, he, what He's done for us. He created us to please Him. Are you pleasing God or are you pleasing your flesh? Are you pleasing God or are you pleasing the world? 
like a wife over God, or a husband over God, or a son over God, or a daughter over God, or co-workers over God, neighbors over, lost neighbors over God. First Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him, who died for us. 1 Corinthians 15.3 For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. There's your repentance. How Christ died for our sins. And God gets into more detail, which we will, in repentance, as having godly sorrow, having sorrow for those sins that God died for. That Jesus Christ, who's God the Father manifest on the flesh, was nailed to the cross and died for our sins. There's supposed to be sorrow for what he went through because of your sins, because of my sins. And that sorrow needs to be remembered. The mindset. Jesus died for me. So I can be free from the ultimate consequence of sin. My sins will put him up there. I'm not going to continue in my sin. Lord, give me the strength. Give me the wisdom. Let me know how I'm supposed to live for you. Give me the strength to get away from this sin and wickedness and this worldliness. That's somebody who's truly saved and born again. Someone says, oh, who cares? You can't judge me. I'm going to live however I want to live. Who cares what the Bible says? That's not someone who's saved. How he died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. What Jesus had to go through. Have you forgotten, brother, says Christ? You got saved, let's say you've been saved 20 years. Have you slowly forgotten what Jesus Christ went through to save you? Have you forgotten? Some people believe that we should go, you, you tell someone the gospel at salvation, then you're done with the gospel. No, you need to be reminded of the gospel for the rest of your life and your walk with the Lord. Why? Because you, some of the brethren out there, I get so frustrated because of my love for them. If I didn't care about them, I wouldn't care. Do your thing. Go, head, you're heading for destruction? Go for it. You falling flat on your face? Go for it. Who cares? The reason I get frustrated is because I love you. And there's brethren out there that have forgotten who saved them, why they got saved, why they needed to get saved, and who it is they serve. They're getting into serving the flesh. They're getting into serving the world. They start doing things Satan's way. Their mindset's not on God's way. Their mindset's starting getting on the three enemies and doing things their way. They forget what Jesus Christ went through for us on the cross. They forgot it was because of your sins, repentance, that comes before the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Let's see if I lost my place here. Oh, up there, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 that we just read. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we arise. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope and living for that blessed hope. If He calls me home before that blessed hope happens, I still get to be part of the blessed hope. Whether we wake or sleep, we're all going to be with Him. 1 Thessalonians 5.8, But let us who are of the day be sober. While we're still down here, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, a hope of salvation. I always say that mindset, we're always supposed to have that mindset, we could get called home any day now. Loving God with all your mind, are you looking for that blessed hope? Do you have that mindset? It could happen any day now. Or have you given up on it, like some of the brethren have? Oh, I don't believe in the imminent return anymore. God wasn't... We look back and know that God didn't come back in Paul's time. 
But because God didn't come back in Paul's time doesn't mean Paul wasn't looking for it with the life that he was living. And the Bible proves he was looking for it with the life he was living and he even said he's looking for it many times. For a ho helmet for a hope of salvation. We're supposed to have that helmet on that's basically saying we're looking for that blessed hope for Jesus to come in the clouds with the life that we're living every day. We're living for Jesus Christ every day because he could come back any day now. Titus 2.12, whether we wake or sleep, Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Oh, no, no, there is no changed life. There is no change. You're dealing with Satanists. You're dealing with changed Satanists. You're dealing with people that are trying to please both sides. I know some brethren that I don't believe are Satanists. Excuse my throat. <clears> throat> That you're dealing with people that are trying to please both sides, like the Babel building people. I know brethren that were in the Babel building where it's filled with both lost and saved, and they're trying to please both sides. Yeah, there should be a changed life, but it doesn't have to be. You're serving, you're not serving God and His Word, and you're now serving Satan, willingly or unwillingly. Teaching us that they're supposed to be teaching you that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Notice it says we should. Because they'll point that out to me. Yes, that means that we are still in this wicked body of flesh. There's times we're going to stumble and we're going to fall. And God's got to pick us back up. And we got to get back to living for the Lord. Repent, forsake, and get back to walk with the Lord. He knows we're going to fail sometimes. That's why it says we should. Just because somebody fails some of this doesn't mean they're lost. And now they're false converts. It should, but our heartfelt attitude is, is we should be living this way. We're not, we should not be justifying not living this way, which is what easy believism does. All these false gospels and false religions, they justify not living this way. We're supposed to be living this way. And when I don't, I beat myself over the head with this because God hit me over the head with this verse by the Holy Spirit. Then I start beating myself over the head. When I start getting frustrated, brothers and sisters, you know the number one person I'm always frustrated with the most? This man right here. You think I'm perfect? No, I struggle with the flesh. I struggle with the world. I struggle with Satanists out there trying to get me to go do things Satan's way. And I get so frustrated, and I, I, the Lord, I talk to the Lord and say, Lord, this is the man I'm frustrated with the most, especially when I fail. When I fail the brethren, I fail the Lord first, I fail you. I fail the lost world by not being a good light. For Jesus Christ. The one person that you need to look in the mirror and deal with is that person in the mirror. Before you deal with anybody else. Just throwing that out there real quick. But we should live this way and our heartfelt desire is, is I want to live this way. Someone who's truly saved and born again. 13. Looking for that blessed hope. That's what it means to look for it. Living godly. Living in Christ Jesus. Living for Jesus Christ every day with that's your looking for that blessed hope. And that mindset, when people take their eyes off that blessed hope, oh, we're not supposed to look for it. There is no imminent return of Jesus Christ. Look at what happens to them. They're min if they're in ministry, their ministry goes downhill, big time. Their following, goes, they start dragging in a lot of lost people are following them, mixed in with saved. They're not hardly offending people anymore. That's a big one. Looking for that blessed hope. When brethren, whether they're in ministry or out of ministry, brothers or sisters in Christ, when you stop looking for that blessed hope, your walk with the Lord starts falling apart. Big time. <clears throat> you can try to use <clears throat> good words and fair speeches all you want and try to wrestle the scriptures to your own destruction and use the scriptures deceitfully, but it's not going to hide the fact that we can see by your life that you're living, you're not looking for that blessed hope anymore. Blessed is Christ, that mindset. Are you still looking for that blessed hope with the life you're living every day? You're looking for Jesus to come back in the clouds every day. That's not that popular anymore. It's uh, that The true teaching of that is being faded out from most of the brethren in the life that you're living. This is a wake-up call for me as well as his few. Like I said, I beat myself up first before I start talking to the brethren to exhort you to do what's right. And the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, 
that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Notice what it said, we should live soberly. There's times we're going to fail, and the Bible says in 1 John, if we repent, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a day where he's going to redeem us from all iniquity, this wicked body of flesh. He's going to give us a new body. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Verse 15, this is where those men, that their mindset, they're not looking for that blessed hope anymore. They've turned their back on the imminent return. Why? Verse 15, these things speak, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. They're not preaching, looking for that blessed hope and being ready for Jesus Christ to come back in the clouds. They're too busy trying to preach, you know, being ready for the time of Jacob's trouble. For the economic collapse, for the World War III that might happen, the Civil War that might happen here in America, for, you know, the economic collapse that might... He, they're too busy trying to get you distracted by the world. Live right, according to this book, do right, pray, and trust God. And trust God. He knows what He's doing. Looking for that blessed hope is what we're supposed to be living for. If we have to go through some serious hard times, Brother Jesus Christ, I talked to the Lord and said, if we have to go through some hard times to get those last few souls saved, because remember, you have to become broken. Sometimes God's got to break us. There's some people that you listen to their testimony, God didn't have to do much to break them. Some people you listen to their testimony and God really broke them and brought them to their knees. Sometimes it takes going through hard times to wake people up. Maybe we have, God has us going through hard times so we can be there as a light in these dark times to witness to people and bring them to Christ. We're not supposed to be distracted and stop being a light. We're not supposed to stop being a living witness and a verbal witness because we're too busy trying to prepare for hard times. You can prepare for hard times. I'm not against it, Brother Christ, but don't forget we're supposed to be a light. You don't stop living for Jesus Christ. The mission doesn't change no matter what's going on in the world. Fear God and keep His commandments. The mission doesn't change. The life that we're supposed to live for Jesus Christ doesn't change because of how bad the world's getting. Don't get distracted. Romans 10.8 But what saith it? The word is, in, is nigh thee, even in my, thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is... The word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whoever shall believe in him shall not be ashamed. People are trying to take prayer out. Remember, it's repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And God, we just read about it, God's the one that does the saving. You didn't earn it with your faith. It isn't faith alone. It's God's grace. God alone saves people. And He saves people by God's grace, by His grace. How do we find that grace today? Through faith. It takes faith to repent. It takes faith to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It takes faith to confess both to God in prayer, a God you've never seen, a God that you rejected. Like just a few moments earlier, you rejected Him. And remember, we talked about it. It all happens in the heart. It's not works. Don't fall for the lie. Repentance is works. Prayer is a work. You're dealing with demon-possessed Satanists is what you're doing if you listen to those people. And they're only going to lead you to hell. Okay. They all happen in the heart. And the Bible says it happens before salvation, before salvation. You want God's salvation? You have to do it His way. Loving God with all your mind. You have that mindset. Lord, I'm going to do it your way. Show me I'm doing it your way. It starts at salvation. Are you doing it God's way? That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart... That the mouth, remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And you have people that say, oh, prayer is not as a work. We don't do that. You know what? It's got their name. Verse 11. 
For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him, on him shall not be ashamed. They're ashamed. Why are they ashamed? Because they refuse to get saved God's way. Brothers and Christ, we got saved God's way. We need to remember why we got saved. How we got saved. Why we got saved. Why we needed to get saved. Who it is that saved us. And we need to remember who it is we serve. I belong to Jesus Christ now. I am His. But you have brethren that are starting to act like they're the world's. They're the flesh. They belong to the flesh. They belong to the world. They're starting to do things Satan's way. Get back to the Bible. Get back to reading it. Get back to studying it. Get back to praying over it. Get back to doing things God's way and remembering what God did for you. That's true love in God with all your mind. Acts 2.21 says, And it shall come to pass that whoso shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, that's Acts, it's transition book. But, you know, oh yeah. Romans 10, 34, 13. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, I'll keep saying it again. When someone says, the Romans rode to hell, the Romans rode to hell, you're dealing with a Satanist. Anybody that says that, you're dealing with a Satanist. You're dealing with someone who's lost and on their way to hell. Romans are Gentiles. And Paul is preaching the gospel that was revealed to him for the time of the Gentiles. Salvation goes out to the whole world. Anybody can get saved. And like I said before, you notice these people, they'll grab some verses from Romans and say, it's for today. The ones that they like, cherry picking. But they don't like this. They want to do away with prayer. They want to do away with repentance. So they say, the Romans rode to hell. Cuckoo, cuckoo. The Bible says a double-minded man, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. These people are wicked people. I, I'll say it, demon-possessed. It's how you get saved. You have to ask God to save you. It's there throughout. We did this one thing where we sat down, Brother Christ, in one of my older videos, where we went through all the Old Testament. We went through uh, call, the word call. It means to ask God to save you, and it's been going on since the very beginning. God's the one, and we just read about it. God's the one that does the saving. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He does the saving. If, if you want saved, you need to ask Him to save you. Why would you take that out? Only a Satanist would do that. They don't want you getting saved. Now in the end, each individual person has to answer for themselves. But brothers and sisters Christ, we're fighting a battle out there trying to preach the true plan of salvation with all these false gospels out there. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're fighting that with this world. You're, we just read, looking for that blessed hope. What does it mean? Having a changed life. It means living for Jesus Christ. It means sanctification. I don't know if I've got this in my notes, but remember what it means to be in Christ. Yes, I have it over here, so I don't want to get too far. Right. But we're going to get it. What does it mean to be in Christ? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Ephesians 2.10. Remember, they like Ephesians 2.8 and 9. We're going to get into this a little bit more later. But 2.8 and 9, but they don't like 10. What does 10 say? For we are his workmanship created in Christ. Prove it. I'm in Christ. Prove it. We're going to get to that. In Christ Jesus unto good works with God before ordained that we should walk in them. Remember it says should. God knows we're in this wicked body of flesh. God knows we're going to fail Him sometimes and fall flat on our face and we get back up. But our heartfelt desire should be we should be walking in them. We don't, we're not, the ones that make justification for not walking in them. That make light of not walking in them. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Uh, you're dealing with people that aren't saved. If you're truly saved and born again, you want to walk in them. You're in Christ Jesus. You want to continue to walk in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ, who hath God has made unto us wisdom. What's the beginning of wisdom? Fear. Fearing the Lord. What's the end of wisdom? Keeping his commandments. We read that. And righteousness. We talked about being a living witness. 
a light to this dark world. God saved me and put me on the right path. He can save you and put you on the right path. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has a zero tolerance for sin. This fake Jesus, this antichrist Jesus of easy believism, the Babel building system, he's, he, he's, he's, he's got a tolerance of sin. He's okay with sin. He just loves everybody. Jesus has a, such a zero tolerance for sin that he died on the cross because of the world's sins. Because of sin. He had to be sacrificed. That's how serious sin is. Have you forgotten, brother, says Christ? People seem to be forgetting. You're supposed to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be a living witness of what Jesus Christ did for you. Have you forgotten that? In sanctification, be holy as I am holy, Jesus said. You're supposed to live a sanctified life. You're supposed to be set apart from this world. People are supposed to be mocking you. Oh, you just think you're holier than thou. Yes, we are supposed to be better than the world and set apart from the world. We're supposed to be cleaner than the lost world is. Remember what it said should. Yes, there's times we fall on our face. But there still should be a difference between us and the world when it comes to the life we're living and sanctification. When you're in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you have people that say, well, wisdom is just, you know, the world's wisdom. They promote the world's wisdom. There is no fear in God. You don't fear God. It just, it just means no God. And, you know, God's righteousness is imputed to us, so we have a free pass to heaven. But they don't like talking about how you're supposed to be a living example, a living witness, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And sanctification, no, oh, it's not that big of a deal. You're dealing with people that aren't in Christ. You're dealing with what Paul had to deal with, false brethren. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Dogs and sows. And if you know your Bible, you know what that what I'm talking about when I say that. And the last part here says redemption. You're looking for that blessed hope. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're looking for that blessed hope every day. Some brethren are forgetting to do that. Verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I've come across people that they try to glory in the Lord with sin and wickedness and worldliness. They look like the world, act like the world, and they say, well, I'm glorying in the Lord. No, the Bible's got their number. Remember when the Bible said that they glory in their shame? Who mind earthly things? They're not glorying in the Lord. You can't glory in the Lord in sin and wickedness and worldliness. How do you glory in the Lord? We just read all that. By lining up with this book, with the life that you're living. That's when you can give God glory. You got saved His way. He saved you. You give God glory for His salvation. Him saving you. Because you did it His way. You give God glory on living for Him. And being an ambassador, when you see someone get saved... You lead someone to Christ and He saves someone and He uses you as a servant. You give God the glory. Sanctification. God cleans up your life. You give God the glory. Looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living. Always having that mindset that no matter what happens down here, I get to be with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I get to be with the Lord someday, either in death or in being caught up in life. You can give God glory. You can't give God glory in Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, uh, porn, uh, drunkenness, sexual perversions, okay, fornication, and I can go on and on, worldliness, doing things the world's way, not God's way. You can't give God glory, but there's people who still think they can. What are they really doing? They're glorying in their shame. They're not giving God glory, they're glorying in their shame. And they're on their way to hell. I didn't say you couldn't fail the Lord. I don't glory in, in my shame. When I, I fail the Lord, and I do still sometimes. I make mistakes. I say things the wrong way. If I ever do something that's wrong, I have sorrow in my heart. I don't glory in it. And I pray to God for mercy and forgiveness and help to get me back on the right path. You don't glory. I don't give God glory for my sin and wickedness, my doing things the wrong way or saying things the wrong way. 
And it comes back to 1 Corinthians 8, 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Do you love God, brother, says Christ, with all your mind? Is that, what's that mindset? Do you, have you forgotten who God is? Have you forgotten his way? That you're supposed to have that mentality. You might not know everything, but you have that attitude and that heart and that mind. I want to do things God's way. Show me your way, Lord. I want to do things your way. Some people go into this book wanting to do things their own way. And we've read about it. They wrestle the scriptures to their own destruction. They handle the word of God to see for why. Because they try to get God to conform to them. They want their way from the very beginning. And they go in here trying to force God to do things their way. To force God to think the way that they think. They don't come to here saying with the mindset saying, God, whatever it is, I want your way. I want your way and I want your thoughts. I want to line up with you, Lord. I want to conform to you. Right. 2 Timothy 1.7, we read, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Here's the key words here for 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Now we talked about you repent, you believe, you confess both in prayer, and you ask God to save you. Why, Why do you confess both in prayer and ask God to save you? To show that you're not ashamed of the gospel. You're ashamed of your sin, but you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you ask God to save you, proving that it was God, only God can save. You didn't earn it. I didn't earn it. When you ask somebody for something, you didn't earn it. These easy believism that's taken prayer out completely, repentance out and taking prayer out, they're saying they've earned it with their actions, the life that they live. They've earned salvation with their faith. They've earned it. I don't have to ask God for something I earned. You don't ask somebody for something you earned. You ask somebody for something that you didn't earn. It's a favor. I need help. I'm asking. If someone owed me money, you tell them, give me the money that you owe me. But if you were desperate and you needed some money to pay a bill and you didn't have it, you would ask somebody for some money, like a family member or a friend. Hey, can I borrow some money? I, I need help. And you're asking because you didn't earn it. And when they take asking away, you're dealing with people, Be that thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Some people will take the works and say, hey, I'm earning salvation with my works. No, I didn't earn salvation in any way, shape, or form. It's a gift. It's a blessing. It's God's mercy on me. But now that I'm saved, I do good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 8, 8 9, 10. Ephesians 2, 10 that we just read. We are ordained to good works after salvation. This is talking about ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. It's talking about at salvation, not of works. Now, in the life of a Christian, you're supposed to have good works. But at salvation, you didn't earn salvation with your works. But according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Remember, Jesus was there from the beginning. Have you forgotten who God is? Have you forgotten who Jesus is? That mindset. Jesus is God, the Father manifest in the flesh. He was there from the very beginning. In Christ Jesus, before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. What this is talking about is that, the, that God had already had a plan to save mankind through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's the gospel that we have today was that God set it up from the beginning of the world. This isn't about Calvinism where only certain people can get saved. No, it's talking about the plan of salvation for today. God was already thinking about us before the world began. God was always already preparing a way for us to get saved. God loves us. He want, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loved, I should say it right, God loved us. God loves His creation. He doesn't want to see us go to hell. He provided a way for us to get saved, but you've got to go to Calvary if you want that love. You've got to get saved His way if you want God's love to be on you. God's grace, God's mercy. You reject Jesus Christ, you reject repentance, you reject prayer, 
confessing both in prayer and asking God to save you. All you have is the knowledge of what Jesus went through. You don't have faith. You're not saved. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Still talking about salvation. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. A preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Brother and Sister Christ, it doesn't hurt to stay in the gospel from time to time. It doesn't hurt. In fact, it's a good thing to go over the gospel. To listen to good gospel preaching every so often. Well, I've been saved for 20 years. When's the last time you heard a good gospel preaching? A good uh, teaching on the plan of salvation. Well, it's been a while. You might want to get back into it as a reminder. These, staying in God's Word is always refreshing our heart. All the doctrines. Talking about how important God's Word is to the true plan of salvation, eternal security, the Godhead, the, uh, the day of Christ, the, that blessed hope, you know, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. You need to keep refreshing your heart. I've seen brethren that they haven't gone over that study when it comes to the catching away in so long that now they've turned their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they haven't been preaching it. They haven't been keeping it fresh in their hearts. They haven't been keeping it fresh in your hearts. What happens? You tend to start turning from it. You tend to start forgetting about it. Have you forgotten who it is that saved you, brothers and sisters Christ? Why you got saved, why you needed to get saved, who it is that saved you, and who it is you serve. We're supposed to keep the gospel fresh in our heart. We're supposed to be ready. To, Paul, uh, Peter says we're supposed to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. Ephesians, we're going to go through the whole thing now. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved. It's God that does the saving. Period. It's God that does the saving. And these people, we call them out for it. And it says, save through faith. And they're like, faith alone, faith alone. We're like, um, the Bible doesn't say faith alone. You're saved by God's grace. Then they start changing their chant from faith alone to grace alone through faith alone. No, it's God's grace that saves. And how do you find God's grace today? Through faith. In the Old Testament, different dispensations, there's times where you found God's... There's works and faith. Sometimes it was just works. How did you find? How did Adam and Eve find God's grace? Through works. There was no faith. Jesus was walking with them and talking with them. Jesus, because uh, Jesus is God, He was there at the beginning. He was walking with Adam. He stood there and created animals right in front of Adam. There's no faith. It's just works. Okay. And what's the works? Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's works. There's different dispensations. Today it's just faith. You find God's grace through faith. It's one thing for them to say you can only find God's grace today through faith. That's true. But when they start saying faith alone and cutting out grace, and then when you call them out on it, they turn around and go, well, it's grace alone through faith alone. They're still trying to avoid repentance. They're taking out prayer. And what they're avoiding, we're going to keep reading. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. This is talking about at salvation, not of works. You didn't do anything to earn salvation, lest any man should boast. What are they trying to avoid when they try to say faith alone? They, a, they're turning faith into works. They've earned it with their faith. But they're trying to avoid verse 10 here. For we are his workmanship. This is after salvation. After you find God's grace through faith. No works, through faith. Afterwards, this is what they're trying to avoid. With a passion. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Evidence of, of repentance. Evidence that you went through faith to find God's grace, to get for God to save you after salvation. Evidence that God saved you. They're trying to avoid the evidence. Paul says, prove your own selves. They're trying to avoid it with a passion. Why? Because they don't want to give their life to Jesus Christ at the cross. They don't want to. Their life is their own. They're still going to they, they love the flesh. They love the world. 
They have no problem looking like the world, talking like the world, acting like the world. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 1 Corinthians 8.3 But if a man love God, the same is known of him. This no, There's no change life gospel is a no resurrection gospel. We have studies on that, brother says Christ, or brethren have taught that. Jesus was right. Jesus is dead, dead and buried. The old man is supposed to be dead and buried with Christ. The new man is supposed to be raised with Christ. The new man created in Christ Jesus is unto good works. The new man is in Christ where he fears God and does his best to keep his commandments, his word. He's an ambassador, righteousness. He's, a, he's an ambassador for Jesus Christ. He's a living witness and a verbal witness. Sanctification, he's supposed to be living for Jesus Christ. Sin doesn't please God, so he gets sin out of his life as best he can. And redemption, he's looking for that blessed hope. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. <clears throat> Brother says Christ... If you've come across this channel and you've realized that you've never repented, you need to get your heart right with God. You need to get saved today. Now is the day of salvation. If you have gotten saved and you've realized that you've started backpedaling, uh, trying to resurrect the old man, and you start starting to go the way of the world and you know being distracted by the world, you need to come back and focus yourself on Jesus Christ and get back to what matters and get back to living for Him. God will take care of the world. We need to be living for Jesus Christ. We need to have that mindset. God, it's your way that matters. No matter what happens in this world, it's your way that matters. No matter how many times I fall and fail you, O Lord, help me to get back up on my feet and get back to doing things your way. That mindset. How does one love God with all their mind? Remembering who He is. Remembering that it's His way that matters. And remember, remember what God has done for us. He saved us. He, put a, he not only saved us eternally. There's a lot of times down here He saved me temp temporal in the, in the physical. He saved me from my own faults, my own mistakes down here plenty of times. I should have gone through worse. Like I should have had harder times. I should have been punished. I should have gone through some bad... My, my mistakes should have caused a lot more worse things to happen to me. But God saved me from it. Sometimes God also allows us to go through some of our mistakes to correct us, to make us stronger. But there's a lot of times, I bet you if you look back, where God saved you from a worse fate down here. Okay. Now, real quick, the same mind. I wanted to end it here, but then God put it on my heart to do two things real quick. Just a little side note. The same mind, we're supposed to have the same mind, and that mind is, a, is in Christ. Okay, there's verses after verse, uh, Romans 12, 16, Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Our mindset needs to be that it's God's way, and we all need to have the same mindset together, brothers and Christ, that it's God's way. Right. Who God is, God's way, and what God has done for us. We need to be of the same mind. Today, we're, we're being told, no, there's things we can agree to disagree on. Chapter and verse on that. Ask them. Next time someone says, we can agree, where does it say we can agree to disagree on anything when it comes to the Word of God? When it comes to God's way, His way, we can disagree on it. It's nowhere in Scripture. But how many of you have heard preachers stand up there? There's things we can agree to disagree on. That's nowhere in Scripture. That's nowhere in Scripture. What does the Scripture teach? We're supposed to be of the same mind. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. When you're of one mind, we live in peace. Why is there so much contention in the body of Christ today? I'm not talking about the false converts. I'm not talking about the wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm not talking about the false religion. I'm talking about Bible-believing Christianity, especially online. Why are we not living in peace? Because we're not of the one mind. 
We've been taught and lied to and deceived that we can have difference in opinions and we can have our opinions and feelings when it comes to, when it comes to theories, absolutely. When it comes to absolute truth, there is no, we, we can agree to disagree. We all need to be on the same page. We all need to be of the same mind and we're not. That's why there's so much con uh, confrontation and fighting going on among the body of Christ. You're not of the same mind. 1 Peter 3.8, finally, be ye all of one mind. Even Peter says, be of one mind. Having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Philippians 2.2, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Having the same love, being, one of, being of one accord, of one mind. Now, what is that same mind? It's not just any mind. My mind, you need to line up with my mind. Everyone needs to line up with my mind. That's not the same mind. Romans 15, 6 says that ye may in one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 5, back a verse, it says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like minded one towards another according to Jesus Christ Jesus. Why? Verse 6, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. We have to be like-minded. Romans 7, 25, we read, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin, through Jesus Christ, the mind of Christ getting ahead of myself. 1 Corinthians. We get to 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 8.3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Brothers and sisters of Christ, that like mindness, when it says we're supposed to be of the same mind, it's supposed to be the mind of Christ. We're supposed to be on the same page, and we're supposed to be standing together, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Why is there so much contention? Because we're not of the same mind. you got a lot of feelings and opinions coming. you got a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing coming in. Snakes, serpents. You've got brethren that are becoming part of the falling away. They're turning their back on this. They're tur turning their back on who God is. They're turning their back, because like I said, there's some brethren that start putting God in a box and limiting God. Oh, I don't see how God could do something like that. You're limiting God and putting him in a box. Your thoughts are, you're not trying to act like your thoughts are higher than God's thoughts. And that your ways are higher than God's ways. We're supposed to be of the same mind. And it's a struggle in these last days. It might just, I'll be honest with you, brothers, it might get worse. The fighting and the arguing among the body of Christ. I got to the point where I just don't have the energy to argue or debate anymore. Someone comes to me wanting truth. I'll preach the truth to them. I'll link the scriptures to them. But if they start getting into a fight or an argument or a debate, I just don't have the energy anymore. Right? I'll, if I, I say that, but there's some brethren that I will still push the boundaries because I love them and I want to see them come to the truth. But as a whole, I just don't have the energy to argue and fight with people anymore. Because the fighting used to be just a little bit, so you had the energy and strength. Someone wants to fight over this? Okay, let's, let's find out where the Bible's right, and I'm wrong. I always say that, Brother Scratch, let's find out where the Bible's right, and I'm wrong. But today, brethren don't want to do that. They don't want to be in the same mind. We're fighting one another. They, we won't talk and come together. But the thing is, is, there was a few disagreements. Now it seems like there's a million disagreements. I'm too tired of arguing over a million disagreements. It's, I don't got the energy. Okay. I want to preach the word and I want to preach it right. And when I'm wrong, there's times I've had good conversations with brethren that showed me where I was wrong. They caught me parroting what I heard someone else say, but never really looked it up myself. And when I looked it up, I'm like, wow, it's not in there. You're right. I shouldn't say it like that. I've been corrected before and we've had a great Bible study. It's those people that I'm just, we're trying, I'm trying to show the scriptures to, and they just come back with feelings and opinions, feelings and opinions, feelings and opinions. Or they're parroting themselves what someone else said, and they'll quote scripture and then parrot what someone else said. I said, no, that, that someone else said, it has nothing to do with the scripture you just quoted. 
You're as you're quoting them, you're not actually comparing Scripture with Scripture. Are you limiting God? Are you putting God in a box? Right? But brothers of Christ, we're supposed to be of the same mind. And there's just so much fighting going on out there. And I, like I said, I think it's just going to get worse because we're in the fallen as way. I don't want it to get worse. I'm not celebrating it getting worse, throwing a party for about it getting worse. I don't want it to get worse. But brothers of Christ, I think, I believe it's just going to get worse and worse. Where the division among the body of Christ is just going to get worse and worse. We're in the falling away. I'm praying to those that are still have a love of the truth, that are striving to have that mindset that who God is, that it's God's way that matters, and remembering it's God that saved you. Who, you know, what God has done for you. That's what I'm trying to reach is people who haven't hardened their heart to the point where they just won't listen. God's going to have to break that heart. We already talked about that. If we have to go through hard times for God to get brethren back on the right path, to break the hard heart of some of the brethren to get them back on the right path, as well as us to be a brighter light to lead people to Christ, He might. He might have hard times come, but the mission doesn't change. Now, we're supposed to be like-minded, of the same mind. And one last part, this is the last part of the study. I know it's been a long study. I might break it up into two parts. Forgive me, I, I'm still in that in the past where people used to love hardcore Bible studies. Today, people want their 15-minute walk, uh, you know, gossip talk Bible studies. And I, th I've done some short videos, but I, I still love the Word of God, and I'm going to continue preaching the Word as God puts it on my heart. The last part I want to put on here is people have their minds blinded. We're supposed to be of the same mind, and that's why you have a lot of fighting going on. We're not of the same mind. The mind of Christ. Wolves in sheep's clothing are coming in, whispering in people's ears, getting them to go to the left, go to the right, and not getting them to stay, and they're not staying on the straight and narrow path. You got the flesh coming in, talking them out of things, and going to the left and right. You got the world coming in, talking to the left and right. You got Satan, the three enemies, and we're not all in the same mind, the mind of Christ. But why is that? Because people are having their minds blinded, mainly the lost world. But some of the brethren are starting to act like lost people. They're starting to have their mind blinded. This is no longer the final authority. They've forgotten who God is. They've forgotten that it's God's way that matters. Some of them try to, like I said, they try to make God's way their way. They try to get God to conform to them. They put God in a box. 2 Corinthians 3.14 But their minds were blinded. For until this day remain at the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. I'm talking about the Jewish people. Why do a lot of, some Jews get saved, but why the majority of Jews, why do they not get saved? They're blinded. They're blinded. They're under the Old Testament, and they're blinded. They, they can't seem to come to, to Calvary and believe that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. They can't bring themselves to repent. They're so stuck on having to do works to be saved. Uh, they're also stuck on signs and wonders. If I just preach the truth, they won't listen. But if I preach the truth and a huge miraculous sign happens, ooh, ah, they might believe. But they won't believe someone that just tells them the truth. They're blinded. Some people get blinded on works in order to be saved. And they get blinded on the Levitical laws in the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There's people doing that today. I've seen brethren do that today. I believe they're saved, but they're starting to handle the word of God deceitfully. Why? Because they're slowly turning their back on this book. They're, so, they're slowly turning their back on God's way for the world's way. They're becoming part of the falling away. And in the word of God, see, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Not my sight, in the sight of God. Jesus is always with you, brother, says Christ. You think you're alone, you think you're getting away with something, you're not. God sees it. And we're going to have to answer to God someday at the judgment seat of Christ. But verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. 
Some people choose to be blind. They don't want to see. They love the light, their wicked, sinful, wicked life, the fleshly life, carnally minded walk out. They love things the way they are. They don't want to see the truth. They choose to be blind. And whom the God of this world, and who's the one that's offering them the flesh, the world, the wrong way that pleases them, the world as a whole, who's the one blinding them? And whom the lowercase g, God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, Jesus Christ, the body is the image of God, should shine unto them. These people pushing no repentance, repentance is a work, prayers a work, the Romans rode to hell, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, that's them, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them, who is the image of God should shine unto them. They don't want true salvation. They don't want the changed life. They're blind. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Their minds are blinded. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Who uh, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, you know, it's, it's no, we're not supposed to be worshiping God's plural of the Trinity. We're supposed to be worshiping the one true God of the Godhead. God the Father and the person of Jesus Christ. We're to be worshiping Jesus Christ as God the Father. Okay? One God. Chaste virgin to Christ. But a lot of people are, are committing spirit, what's called spiritual fornication. They start getting into false gods. Like I said, you can make things of the world idolatry. You can put things of this world above Jesus Christ, and that thing of this world now becomes a false god. Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, fornication, drugs, uh, alcohol. You can even make something as simple as off-grid living a lowercase g God. I know a brother in Christ who did that. He turned off-grid living into a lowercase g God because he idolized it. God called him to do house church and street witnessing, but he wanted to live his dream life of off-grid living. Uh, marriage. Um, if you can make marriage an idolatry, and I've done it. I'm hitting myself right now. I've done it where I forced marriage when God didn't want that. When God doesn't want something, something that can norm, there's some things that normally aren't sins. Jonah, he went to Tarsus. Is going to Tarsus a sin in itself? Absolutely not. But when God says, I don't want you at Tarsus, I want you in Nineveh, now going to Tarsus is a sin. Jonah was in sin for running to Tarsus. Because God told him to go somewhere else. There's things in my life that might not be a sin, but God says, that's not what I want for you. And when I push the issue and I do it anyway, it becomes a sin because I'm going against God. I made that thing an idol. I've made that thing a false god. Whatever it is, video games. I've heard, I've seen uh, some that I believe are saved, some I believe are false converts. But they make video games false gods. Satanic style music, false gods. Uh, sports, false gods. Idolatry. That's what idolatry is. When you hold that above God, that becomes your God. Whatever you have idolatry towards, <clears throat> whatever you have idolatry towards, that becomes your God. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Chaste virgin to Christ. Jesus Christ is supposed to be your God. God the Father manifests in the flesh. He is your God. Stop fornicating with other gods. Verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. You can be the final authority. It's not what God says. It's what you say. It's what you want that matters. It's not who God is that matters. It's who you are that matters. It's not God's way that matters. It's your way that matters. Yeah, well, God, it's not what God does for you. It's what you do for yourself. Through His subtlety. So your minds, your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. You want to know the number one reason why it's so hard for us to preach the gospel today? Because people's minds are corrupted by false gospels, false Jesuses, 
And they've got that Antichrist spirit, the worldly spirit, and that Jezebel spirit. And we're trying to fight this and try to break through it. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preach another Jesus, whom we have not preached, and that's this easy believism Jesus, this worldly antichrist Jesus that's okay with sin, and all he is is love and joy, all these positive fleshly feelings. They preach another Jesus which we have not preached. Or if you receive another spirit, the Bible talks about the people are having the world, the spirit of the world, which I believe is the Antichrist spirit. And it talks about the Jezebel spirit, which I think is just still the Antichrist spirit. It's another way of saying the Antichrist spirit and how the Antichrist spirit affects people differently with women. Because that spirit of Jezebel, rebelling against God, they call it feminism today. But it's rebelling against God as, as the sin of witchcraft. Okay? They receive another spirit, which ye have not received. Talking about something other than the Holy Spirit. Or another gospel, which we have not, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. These people that are given into this false Jesus, receiving a different spirit, not the Holy Spirit, because they're following false gospels. They're all going to go to hell. That's where Satan's going. That's what it says here. That you might well bear with him. Who's the him? The serpent. Satan. Where's Satan going to end up? He's going to end up in the lake of fire someday. To burn for all eternity. And you're going to be right there next to him if you don't follow, do things God's way. If you don't come to God believing who he is and doing things his way. Having that mindset. True salvation. 1 Corinthians 8, 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Who's the number one person? Satan goes around and blinds the minds. And what we're doing is we're trying to shed light on the world when it comes to the gospel. We're trying to shed the light of the truth for those who do get saved and start getting messed up. We try to show them the truth. Brothers, this is Christ. I know it's been a long study. But loving God with all your mind is, is having the mindset of believing that who God is. And the scriptures open it up. There's a lot of things we don't understand. The mystery of godliness is great. But God shows us a lot about who he is. Okay? Creator of all things. He's eternal. He's perfect. God, the Bible teaches us these things. We need to remember who God is. Who Jesus is. God the Father manifest in the flesh. He's also perfect. We need to remember that it's God's way that matters. Not our ways. We need to have that mindset, not get blinded, but have that mindset that it's God's way. Not start falling in the trap of the flesh. Not start falling in the trap of the world or doing things Satan's way. We need to remember it's God's way that matters. And thirdly, we need to remember when you love God with all your mind, remembering what God has done for you. Not just eternal security, not just eternal salvation, but salvation in this life. How many of you can sit there, that, that, that uh, song... Count that him, count your blessings one by one. See what the Lord has done. Do you have that mindset of, hey, I need to remember everything that the Lord's done for me? Mainly salvation. I need to remember who it is that saved me, why I got saved, why I needed to get saved, who it is that saved me, and who it is I serve. Am I serving Jesus Christ, or am I starting to fall into serving the flesh? Serving the world. Satan getting me to turn my back on, on Jesus because I'm not putting on the whole armor of God. Brothers says Christ, stay in the book. Stay in prayer. Okay, Loving God always comes back to God's word. It always does. How do we know God? Through his word, by the Holy Spirit. How we know what God's will is? Through the word, by the Holy Spirit. How do we know what God has done for us? We learn the gospel through the King James Bible, through God's perfect word today. It's God's word, whether it's the spoken word, whether the gospel is being preached verbally, or you read the gospel. But this is Christ. We need to get our head back and our mind being one, you know, having the same mind, and we need to get back to that, that mind being in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So I'm going to end this study with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your prayers and I'll see you in the next Bible study.